Kerry, mm. after all the training, there's a point at which I presume that you say, I'm prepared to put this forward. Is How did that come about then, if you've oh, unpublished I've, I've, novels? And <laughs> oh, I have, uh, yeah, I've unpublished novels are about this big. I still love them. Um, if I ever run out of inspiration, which is, I suppose, impossible in some way, I will go back and rewrite all the ones. And they're, they're good stories. They just aren't as good. I'm not as. I, I got. I've been getting better and better at, you know, writing, conveying exactly what I mean to say. You never say exactly what you mean to say. It's the same thing as painters. You say that's a marvelous landscape. And they say it isn't quite what I thought it was going to be like. It's never the same in your head <laughs> as it is, you know once you've turned it into a three-dimensional thing. Yeah, I finally got through law and I joined Legal Aid because they'd invented Legal Aid by the time I got there. I'm very old. And um, so I had what I wanted. That was half of what I wanted to do. And I thought, right, okay, I'm good at magistrates' courts because magistrates' courts are actually more people than anything else. And magistrates' courts where 85% 80, of all people meet the law. So it's where they need people like me who are not going to be unduly shocked um, by really anything, really, <laughs> and who's, first of all, I was meeting my classmates and then I was meeting their children, and, and I remember the year when the, all the Jasons got to the children's court. I thought, oh, gracious, I am getting old. Anyway, so then I thought, right, I really want to get published, so I wrote some more books, and then I tried to get them published by sending them around to all the publishers in the phone book. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and there were no writer centres, there was no... The cultural isolation of the West was absolute in the old days. Uh, so I got nowhere, but finally I put a book called Bad Deeds at Bear Brass, which was a thing I've written about... Uh, Williamstown used to be called Bear Brass. I made a revisionist history and made the Dutch arrive, uh, not getting wrecked on their brawl holes, but actually arriving in um, Port Phillip, which is actually quite a nifty idea. And I put it into the Vogel Prize because I was still under 30. Anybody who's got a novel, stick it in the Vogel Prize. Stuff can happen. And it wasn't a very good novel, but Hilary McPhee, who was the head of a published feminist publishing house, yeah, McPhee Gribble, saw it, rang me up at Legal Aid and said, come and talk to us. So I went past my boss, he, said, he says, with a Doppler effect. I'm going to go and see a publisher. <laughs> when I got there, they said, nice book, Kerry, we can't publish. And I thought, oh, that's all right. Just, I'll just go throw myself under a tram. It was in Brunswick Street, big pink factory. In, and they said, Look, write us another book, we'll give you a two book contract. I said, yes. It would have taken surgery to remove the two book contract from my hand. And they said, what, I said, what do you want? I would write anything and at all. And they said, what about a detective story? I said, yes. I've been reading them since I was a tiny. I never actually tried to write one before. And then I thought I got what is known in the trade as the oh shit reflex. <laughs> I thought, oops, okay, um, I'll just go home and think about it, shall I? I think you know, that's a pretty uh, yeah. universal reflex yeah. in many ways. What have I done? You know. So I remembered that back in uh, when I was doing legal history at university, there was an amazing professor called Ruth Campbell, Dr. Ruth Campbell, who was the best historian I've ever met, who, remarkable woman, she's just unfortunately died. Lots of people are dying on me this year. I wish they wouldn't. And uh, she... Um, she said, original research is the only way to go. Don't believe historians, especially me. Go back and look it up. So I was, I was, you know, there were there were six women in my intake of 200 at the first year law that year. And all of the other women had gone to private schools. So there was me. <laughs> and it took me a while to find myself a peer group. But I did finally. But anyway, I was feeling a bit isolated. And I... Th I thought uh, everybody else was doing legal history, you know, my grandfather, the judge, or whatever. I didn't have that kind of background. And I thought, on the other hand, I've got to use my impeccable working class credentials for something. So um, I thought, aha, 1928, there was a huge strike. It closed down the Melbourne waterfront, or the waterfront all over Australia for more than a year. And it produced some extremely nifty, um, repressive legislation. So I said, I'll write about that. So I the Waterside Workers Federation, as it was at the time, now they're the MUA, let me read their archives. And I spent a week sleeping on a friend of mine's floor in Canberra reading the archives, where they'd just taken the filing cabinet drawer and emptied it into a wooden box. So it had pencil leads, bits of shopping list. And all. I had to break two codes to read Big Jim. Um, 
uh, his diary. It was quite interesting. Anyway, I learned all that stuff. And then I found all the old men I could find who were on the wharf in 1928. Because in 1928, if you were 16, you were a man. And I found two particularly, Tom Hills, who was known as Red Tom, a red rag, a wobbly. That's the IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, yeah. And his mate, Tipo Hayes, whose grandfather was acquitted of treason at Eureka. Fascinating. The one was, one was short, one was tall, and they, once I stopped trying to interview them and let them talk, they were the funniest. They were the, the occasionally utterly savage. They were fascinating. So I sat there with my ears flapping for hours. I wrote my history of the, of the thing. I also read all the newspapers from the highly respectable age in Argus right down to the Hawklet, a pink journal so ghastly that my great-grandmother would not let my great-grandfather read it in the house. He had to sit on the, on the um, veranda, which he did with a pipe and a glass of beer, and read the Hawklet, which was full of maid's evidence, divorce, and stuff like that. It was cute. Anyway, so I read all that stuff. I did a fat, massive amount of research. I scraped through all my law subjects at year just by this month. And I wrote the paper, got a gold star in an office stamp, and put it away. And then when I, because I couldn't bear to throw it away. And when I was thinking of what am I going to set this time in this time, I thought 1928. I don't want to write about the present because my clients' stories are the only things they've got. And it would be utterly improper of me to steal them. Uh, and I was afraid I would if I was writing about the common the common day, you know. So I thought, okay, I will write about 1928 and I will need a 1928 heroine. So I got on the tram on Brunswick Street and as it clacked down, clack, 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 I thought, help! What do I usually do to start a story? I pick a main character. Aha! I need a main character. She looks like my sister Janet, black hair, short, shorter than me, five foot two. Green eyes, pale skin, black hair, cut in a bobby cut. Um, or the young Diana Rigg, Mrs. Peel, where needed. Uh, I was going to do a female hero, because, and I did. And because everyone else writing feminists, the female women starting to take over detective stories at the time, this is 1988, were writing noir heroes. And I didn't like the noir heroes when they were Humphrey Bogart, even though Humphrey Bogart is gorgeous. So I didn't want to read female noir and I wasn't going to write it. It's too despairing, it's too dysfunctional, and anyway, it's too sentimental. Down those mean streets must go a man who is neither tainted nor afraid. Excuse me. Um, anyway, so I thought I'll write a golden age detective story. I want Harriet Vane without Lord Peter, and I want to write a hero like James Bond with much better taste, fewer product endorsements, Except for Clico. There are a few. <laughs> Except for Verve Clico, and they've yet to send me a case. Um, and you know Verve Clico? Yeah, anyone from Verve, please. <laughs> La Verve Clico, amazing story. Yeah, also the best champagne in the world. And of course, there is, <laughs> there is of course, the lovers, because James Bond's lovers, especially in the books, are very sort of cardboardy. And, uh, you know, those cardboard blondes. Whereas I've always found cardboard lovers to be sort of flat, water-soluble and unresponsive. <laughs> yeah. So I thought I'll have real people. I'll have real lovers. And Franny can have anything she likes. So she has. Only one of them has ever recognised. Actually, he didn't recognise himself. His girlfriend recognised him. <laughs> but these things happen, yeah. Clearly they do. <laughs>